Hey everyone, Keshav here. I am the editor and producer of this episode. Uh, today, Tyler Wells joins Sam, who is a CPA based out of Vancouver. He started his career in the commercial real estate industry and then eventually moved into music and entertainment, where he works today as a CPA um, in the NFT space, working with a brand new asset class. And so he joins Sam to discuss how the accounting industry, which is of course what he works in, um, you know, how it's evolving and how with a CPA designation, you have the ability to define it, create it and, and do what you want with it. Um, in the description to this video, I've linked uh, to two websites uh, that have information on what Tyler is doing within the NFT space. And then as well, a little bit of a background uh, article on what NFTs are in case you want to read up on it a little bit more. Thanks and enjoy the episode. Hi, Tyler. Welcome to my classroom. <laughs> You're like, you didn't do this on any of your other ones. No, I did not. We're going to keep people, keep the people guessing. Hi, Tyler. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, just quickly for the people in the back, how do we know each other? Um, so we met five years ago at a training session in Vancouver for CPA, Western School of Business. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, I was lucky to have you as a mentor. Well, thank you for saying lucky. Uh, yeah, no, we got to meet in beautiful Vancouver, which was always lovely. And then, yeah, we got to work work together in uh, that professional capacity. So being a mentor, 100% online, where we get to communicate like this. <clears throat> so this is a nice, nice little treat because we've seen each other a few times here and there, uh, a few times on video, but, you know, mostly just written or typed communication. So yeah, through the CPA Western School of Business. Uh, so I mentioned Vancouver. That's where we met. Um, I've never lived in Vancouver. Um, maybe that leads us into our next part. So what are you up to now? Um, what locate, are you still in Vancouver or... Yeah, so still living in Vancouver, still working in Vancouver. Um, I'm working in the music and entertainment industry. Uh, okay, well, before <laughs> we go any further, I want to dig into this because, uh, you know, not you're our first person working in the music and entertainment industry uh, that we've kind of brought into our classroom. So Tell me your history. Tell me what led you up until the point that we're at right now. And then I want to dig into what the heck does it look like to be a CPA in the music industry? Okay. So, I mean, I've worked for small companies, big companies, medium-sized companies. And I think I've just kind of realized I like working for smaller companies. There's less politics, less drama. Uh, I think the opportunities are there just as they are for a bigger company. Um, so yeah, I've had the opportunity to kind of work for a lot. So craft beer industry, uh, commercial real estate brokerages, restaurant industry, and now I'm in the music industry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so when you were getting designated, which industry or industries um, were you getting designated in? So I was in commercial real estate. So we sold skyscrapers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have something, you like to be up high and working near the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's the best I got. My analogies are never really on point. Okay, so how did you find that? Because, and just for context here, you are a CPA and then legacy CMA, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so your path towards your CMA would be most like the, uh, the either the experience verification or the approved path method through through industry. So getting your uh, your technical competencies, uh, sorry, getting all the enabling competencies and then getting your technical competencies in more things like finance and management accounting and strategy and governance. Would that be more or exactly. less accurate? Yeah. Okay. And I bring that up because a number of the people watching this are students that are like, they don't necessarily know what they want to do, but they know what they don't want to do. So a number of people will come to me and say, I am thinking about being a CPA, but I don't want to work in a firm. And um, oftentimes they say it to me and like, they're kind of like looking around and they're like, I'm really sorry, especially because they know that I am firm trained, but it's like, that was my path. And that was a path of choice that I made, you know, a decade and a half ago. It's not the only path and it's not the right path. And it's not the path I support. I support the path that is right for you. So how did you, what made you decide to do your, um, your CMA? 
So I always liked just the technicals of accounting. I knew I was like what you said. I knew what I didn't want to do, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I thought the CMA was a good, just high level management style of accounting. And that was what I was into, not so much the public practice route. Yeah. So it gives you that, that, uh, you know, authority, like the ability to speak to numbers and speak to the strategy involving numbers uh, and kind of gave you that base to kind of go after a couple different, different types of roles in industry, you know, in commercial real estate in your experience. So did you stay there your entire designation? I was there for about two years. And then as soon as I got my designation, I left. <laughs> oh, so wait a minute, because I think I know where the story is going next. Uh, how far after you were done your undergrad, did you go work for the commercial real estate company to get your CMA? Was it pretty soon after or a few years or what did that look like? I think it was about probably two or three years. So I had like two jobs before that, three, okay. three accounting jobs before that. Perfect. So I love this because it shows people that you don't need to, <clears throat> it's not, <laughs> it's not a race. And if it is, I don't know what we're racing towards because I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to get to the end <laughs> really quickly, uh, but you can do school and you can work and you can do school, work and get your designation, or you can take some breaks. Uh, like it's, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, so for, in your case, you went to school, graduated, worked, and then in a couple of accounting roles, and then found the role that you started, you know, doing your articling, doing your CMA articling. And that led to your CMA designation. And then <laughs> I feel like we have very parallel paths here. Um, but this is where we'll diverge a little bit because I stayed at the firm for 30 months and two weeks. So that two week buffer zone. <laughs> uh, so tell me a bit about your escape um, afterwards. Um, what, what did you do? Did you like, what did you do when you gave notice after you became designated? So I, I found out I passed and I had this little like woohoo moment. And then it was like three days later, I got this like offer to stay and there was a bonus involved and I had already had my flights booked and all this like all these trips booked uh and I I just politely declined and uh, I went away for three months so you took went, okay so you yeah. declined a nice nice size bonus um and kind of you know safety and security because that's a lot of times what um what companies like to communicate and where the heck did you go for three months so I went, I went sailing in Europe. I went to music festivals. I traveled all over <laughs> and then I came back. I was super refreshed, came back to Vancouver. I actually went to London for a job per job offer, job interview. And I realized how much I hated London. <laughs> I spent, <laughs> was it the weather or? <laughs> uh, I went in August and I just, I heard great things and the money was really good and the opportunity was great. And I spent three weeks there and had friends show me around and all the great things that they love to do in London. And I just quickly realized how much I hated it there. <laughs> so yeah. I came back to Vancouver where I'm close to the mountains, close to the ocean, close to everything I need. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's good to explore though, right? Because what's great for some people is not, you know, ideal for another and that's okay. Like you still had friends there, you still, still saw it and you explored it and you researched it and decided, okay, not for me, even, you yeah. know, with, you know, other job opportunities there, went back to Vancouver. I haven't heard too many people who live in Vancouver saying they don't like Vancouver, but somebody <laughs> will prove me wrong. They'll be like, Vancouver is not for me. And that's okay. They might want to try London, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So you come back and you jump on the first job that you find, right? No. <laughs> oh. Um, I took my time. I, I did a lot of interviews and I was, fortunately I was in a position where I was able to be very picky and I found something that was interesting to me. And one thing that you'll realize when you're in the accounting program is that every time you finish a year of school, someone will head on to you. Someone will offer you a new job. You'll get a promotion or a big raise. And it's really quick, like really easy to quickly grow professionally that way. Um, so when I came back, I thought I was going to be at the job for maybe a year or two. And then I realized how much I loved it. 
And I've been there five years now. It's great. That's uh, his job. That's his job. Yeah. It's oh, this is fantastic that you because you you told me before offline that when you came back, you were on purpose gonna take your time and find the right opportunity. So I just love that you took your time, found the right opportunity that fit, that excited you, and that this is this one. So that's amazing. Yeah, so I'm still there. <laughs> it's great. I didn't think I was going to be there long. I thought I'd be there two years tops and then move into something else because that's what I had done basically every every year, every other year before, like leading up into that. And there's always been, people always headhunt you. They're like, you get an email or a phone call and they're like, hey, we noticed you're great at this. This company wants to pay you this amount of money. Are you interested? And a lot of the times I was interested. So... Um, yeah, I'm, it's not bad to have, listen, it's not bad to have a desirable skill, right? It's a yes. good thing. It's good to have options. It's even better to have options and to be so happy with your present environment because you put yourself in a place to, um, to make that the most out of everything to say, no, thank you. Right. I always <laughs> kind of say that like opportunity cost, right. We teach it in cost management, um, that we want to have a really, really high opportunity cost. I want to be crying at things that I turn down, right? Like, cause that's, that's awesome. Cause it means it's the second best thing and that you're living the best thing. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> uh, okay. So tell me about this current job. Tell me about this current job in the entertainment uh, industry. Uh, what do you mind sharing what company you're with? So I'm with 604 records. It's an independent music label in Western Canada. And uh, I guess we're working on a couple of really exciting projects right now. I was hoping to be able to talk about them, but for confidentiality reasons, I might need to wait a few weeks. Uh, so one of them was in the news a couple of weeks ago. I can talk about that. Yeah. It's, it's uh, so we're just, we're working on these NFT uh, crypto art funds right now so we had an oh, artist just, i'm just gonna pop in there okay. because i did my research before this so oh. nft stands for uh non-fungible tokens yeah. so it is and um, correct me please correct me um if these are a way to assign like value and denominations to things that would otherwise maybe wouldn't have like value per se is that and they exactly. live on the blockchain the blockchain yeah. being ethereum You've done, you've done your homework. Okay. We're, we've exhausted my homework abilities now, but it's really cool because um, did you ever think when you were in the entertainment industry that you would be almost like a, what do they call it? Uh, a DeFi, like a decentral, decentralized uh, like FinTech company essentially, or, you know, playing in that field. Did you ever think no. that there would be overlap? No. Well, <laughs> when I started like Bitcoin was just something you used to buy illegal things online with. And now it's developed into so much more like blockchain is useful. They're, they don't even know, like we don't even know what it'll be used for next month or next year even. So we're starting to see like baseball cards yeah. and like out, there was an album release, like a music release and they're talking That's about nice. using it for concert tickets and things like that. So it's, it's really exciting. It's really fun. Yeah, I was at um, an accounting conference and they talked about like auditing via um, blockchain and they talked about, and of course, I think a lot of people have seen now like contracts just being executable um, via blockchain. So just having that decentralized, you know, that not everything is a cloud, like every computer is a cloud and the cloud is made up of computers. And anyways, I'll probably link down to the, the podcast that I attempted to listen to in order to prepare for this, but it is, it is just so cool. And um, like relating back to you and where you're at that being flexible and having that base skill set to say, okay, like, let's see how this, how this fits in with the entertainment industry, because just cause you go in expecting like one thing, you know, keep your eyes and ears open. And it's, it's so, so cool. So can you um, elaborate a bit more about that item that was in the Globe and Mail? It was okay, the so NF, yeah, the NFT for the, uh, the artist. So we had an artist, he's actually a signed artist to the label and he's just a super talented guy. And he's been creating album artwork for people for years. And he did some artwork for Reebok and uh, Conor McGregor and uh, some fashion labels. I think Diesel was one of them. Uh, but he's been working really hard on his art during like the pandemic because he can't tour. 
and uh, he put his artwork up on this auction site and made like millions of dollars in a couple hours. It was insane. Was the number like 300 million? Pardon me? Was it 300 million or am I just pulling that out of somewhere? Like, no, 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 it wasn't okay. quite that much. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, okay, it was maybe it was three million, but I just remember being like, this is like beyond the scope of what I can comprehend. But it's it's super interesting because the whole premise of it allows secondary resales to send money back to the original artist. So mm. if, if you're an artist and you make a painting and you sell that painting, that's it. You get paid out and then you know, say that artwork goes up in value over time and someone else sells it for 10 times what you originally sold it for, you're out of luck. You're the mm -hmm. artist, but you don't get any of that. So with these NFT artwork pieces, the original artist gets 10% of every resale, which is cool, but it gets even cooler. So all these crypto guys are buying and selling it like stocks right now. So we'll have the art auction on, on a Thursday. And then on Friday, all that artwork is bought and sold could be hundreds or thousands of times over and over and over again. So the original artist is just like, he's collecting 10% on every resale and it's, it's just snowballing. <laughs> so there was an artist last week who sold an auction, an, an art piece at the Christie's auction for $69 million. And anyways, I, I can't say too much more, but we're, we're working on a few exciting things as well. That is ridiculous exciting. Um, yeah, maybe we'll do a part two um, or yeah. Um, the update. <laughs> the update. Thank you for explaining that to me. I didn't realize that bit about the, the resale and the, the commission like locked in. That is ridiculously, ridiculously neat. And um, I like it because it aligns. I always look at like performance incentives and you know what does some right like if we gave a test and I tested the ability to some student to like jump up and down on or sorry on their left leg jumping how many times can you jump up and down on your left leg in a minute we have a whole bunch of like left leg jumpers right <laughs> they're like what what are you struggling one skinny leg uh, and I, I think about this in education a lot I think about this in the business world I'm sure you do too you have a you know a team like we all and ourselves like you kind of see oh, okay this is why I made this decision or um and so if you are, you know, in the art world and you're buying art, um, or you are not only buying and selling as a broker, but perhaps you are a person who is purchasing art and collecting art, you want the artist to like go out and talk about their art and you want them to like have a bigger profile and like, you know, continue to create more cool things and be out there and talk about this. And so I really like how it aligns um, everybody's interests, you know, to talk about the art, to share their art, to, you know, create um, that ongoing kind of perpetual value, which the artists would likely do anyways, because they tend to, you know, get into these sorts of things for, you know, more or less um, because they love it. Um, and so it's really cool to see the performance uh, align um, so, so nicely. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. It's just, it's a nice way to see artists get paid for the, the content that they're creating. It's so like so common to see artists their work never really has any monetary value until after their their death. So it's it's exciting. It's it's like the beginning of a new era for for art, artists. Maybe we'll see. It's still very new. <laughs> it is new, but I think that that's what makes it also exciting, right? And a little bit thrilling that. And as accountants, sometimes um, some of my students will think, "Oh, maybe accounting's not for me. It's not you know as sexy. It's not like." As, you know, it's not like out there, you know, it's more safe, it's more secure. It's like, no, no, no. It can be a number of different things, right? Um, it can be whatever you want it to be. Yeah, it can be whatever you want it to be. So if you want it to be safe, sure. Yeah, go find that. It's there. It's not the game that you're playing. <laughs> That's for sure. So exciting. Um, okay, so we talked a bit about artists and uh, getting the value that they deserve. So just based on your interactions with artists and, you know, seeing, you know, being an independent record label, it, you work with a number of different artists in a number of different kind of places in their career. 
Um, what would you say is kind of the most rewarding aspect of that um, specific to kind of working in an industry that supports artists? The most rewarding aspect is just seeing, I would say like the organic success. Like, so we have artists that really just want to be rich and famous. And then we have artists that really work their butt off because they love playing music. And it's, it's exciting to see where the two sort of separate. <laughs> so yeah. the ones who love playing music are the ones that usually have success. And I think this kind of translates to almost any career path. Like if you love what you're doing, you're going to be good at it. And when you're good at it, people are going to recognize that. And then you're going to have those opportunities to, to get better at it and do bigger things and better things. Uh, so you can't just chase the money. <laughs> no. And because if you chase it, it, and you're after it for the wrong reasons, it sounds like people can see through that. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes, yeah, pretty transactional. You know, um, when, set, when you get an email from somebody, you're like, oh, you want something from me. <laughs> like, you don't really want to see how I'm doing. Like, oh, you want this. Or it's, it becomes very transactional. Whereas, um, yeah, when you see somebody that's working their butt off and then you see them start getting that success and that transaction, that um, that momentum, and it's not that transaction focused, uh, you're happy for them. They're, they're getting more confidence in their work. And it's like that perpetual wheel that kind of, that people can't ignore, right? It doesn't, it, it never happens overnight. No, fair. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it doesn't happen overnight. And Even when it looks like it does, it never happens overnight. And that's for any, any industry, including accountants, right? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you sound pretty busy. Uh, are you just working 24 seven? Um, <laughs> depends who's asking. <laughs> <laughs> depends who's asking. Depends what time of year it is. Yeah. So we're just kind of wrapping up like our insane. It feels like it's been a six month busy season, but, uh, yeah, like when, when I can, I, I like to, I'm snowboarding and mountain biking and, and things like that. So that's what I'm doing this weekend. Very excited about it. <laughs> that is exciting. Uh, is the weather pretty decent out there right now? Yeah, it's great. It's fantastic. That's um, good. You guys get like a 10 month wonderful season, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> I'm just, I'm doing a secret tourism in Vancouver. Not that you guys need it, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, in any other year, I'd be traveling abroad a couple of times a year and then taking a couple of shorter trips kind of in between but yeah this year last year kind of been hard to do that so you're just adding but, to the list of future future places I know, I know. but it's at, it's allowed me to work extra hard over the, like the last year and a half you know just focus on career development and all the things that I like to do which is fine too because I enjoy it I love it it's exciting for me so it's like I can do that here I can do that now or I can do that later so it's been really good no yeah um I mean, thank you for being positive. I know it's, it's different, right? But they were adaptable and um, it'll feel that much better when we get to go back and travel. Um, when you said that you typically would travel a couple times a year, um, like internationally and then a couple smaller trips, I just really want to come back to that because oftentimes um, what our students are hearing, what they've expressed to me is, Sam, I need to... I need to travel in between those four months between or one month or whatever they pick a time between university and my job, because that's the only time I'll ever get to travel ever in my life. <laughs> and this, this isn't the Sam show. So, uh, you know, I know that we have probably talked offline a number about this, but I saw you roll your eyes. What's, what's your response to that? <laughs> so I, I used to think that, if I wanted to take a trip, I had to quit my job because I was never allowed to go. It was like, it'd be month end or year end or quarter end. And I would just never get the vacation time approved. So like, well, I guess I need to quit this job and go to Europe or something for a month or two, but it's not like that. And especially now it's like 2021 and even like everything is more accessible than it's ever been. People have been wor working remotely for over a year now. Um, I think it's it's incredibly easy to work out of an airport on a plane or overseas or, or whatever when the time comes. It's it's never been easier to do that. 
and there's just so much job flexibility. Um, I don't think, I don't know. You can definitely travel, definitely do those kinds of things. Oh yeah. And to the people that said, well, oh, that's only because of COVID and that then it'll go back to the old normal, but you were traveling and doing this stuff before COVID, like exclusively before COVID, before people kind of realized that you could actually have your entire employee base working without seeing them, right? That just because I yeah. can see you doesn't mean you're working. Just because I can't see you doesn't mean <laughs> you're not working. So you've worked in planes, trains, automobiles, <laughs> airport floors, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, airport floors, restaurants, all yeah. sorts, wherever. <laughs> yeah, you just, just a different time zone. And a lot of the time it's really easy to accommodate that. Absolutely, absolutely. If um, people will hire for people and skill set and attitude, not for physical like geography. And if you earn that trust, it's it's a conversation that you can have, right? Absolutely. Cool. I just love that. Um, okay. So do you mind just elaborating a bit about your current role and specifically how you use accounting in your current gig? Um, yeah, I, I use accounting every day to solve problems always implementing process improvements and just developing new revenue streams so yeah. like just for the ex for example like music industry is arguably changing faster than any other business model uh, just in order to stay competitive we're always having to be forward thinking planning ahead anytime you're planning ahead you're working with variables which means there's risks so it's just all about calculating those risks mitigating them and just to, that's how you have to decide whether to go forward or not with a new project. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That there's just so much kind of ties in with life too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's, you just accept the risk. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So we have a couple of questions that came in uh, from students uh, specifically okay. for you. So one of them was what was the most challenging part of completing your CPA CMAs? Um, specifically, were there any difficulties completing yours while in industry? And they want to kind of compare it to somebody who was working in public accounting. So I know that that's, you know, in, in order to kind of get that full answer, there'd have to be a Tyler who did it in industry and a Tyler that did it in, pub, did it in public practice. But I'm assuming you're kind of like me and that you had friends going through a similar journey at the same time. So if maybe you can kind of Talk about the challenging parts for you, um, articling in, in, in industry, and kind of comparing and contrasting to your um, public accounting, like friends or counterparts. Yeah, I, I found for me, it just like the work-life school balance was probably the most challenging part, especially when you're like younger and all your friends are out having fun and you're in school on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> Non-accounting friends, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and like full-time work and school can be pretty demanding some weeks but I found like usually it was sort of balanced by not so busy weeks mm -hmm. so you'd have like a really intense week followed by like a, a not so busy week um personally I just wasn't super interested in public practice which is why I chose industry but I, I think like the public practice route is a great way to sort of fast track your way into upper management uh, especially later in your career people love to see like that big four experience in the resume no, that's, that's great um, kind of perspective and to share and like, A, it's not, it's not the path that you took and you're happy with your path, but that other people's paths will still be valid and that there's a number of different ways um, so that if that's what they want to do, cool, go do that. It wasn't your path and you're happy with where you are um, and thrilled and, but it wasn't easy, right? Like it's, it's not, if it's, if it wasn't hard, it would almost be like anybody could do it, right? We just have like yeah. a whole country full of CPAs because they're like, oh, I just, just took, took an online test, 10 questions, I passed. <laughs> um, Kate, great, thank you. Um, so I don't know, what, what are your future plans? Any options that you're considering? Uh, and this can be you know, related to either your roles at CPASB, uh, your roles at your work. Um, it can be non-work as well. Like, we'll just leave it nice and open. Um, I think eventually I'd like to open up my own little boutique business management firm. But for now, I'm just really enjoying my current position. Like I said, I didn't think I was going to be there that long, but I just, I love it so much. And it's always changing. It's always challenging. 
And there just seems to be these new avenues to explore. So the nice thing about a CPA designation is there's endless opportunities and they always just find themselves to you. <laughs> you get a phone call or an email out of the blue and it's like, okay, like where does this door go? So I think accounting just really provides the ability to work in any industry or any sector that interests you. Do you, do you think that part of those opportunities coming to you have anything to do with your attitude as well? I, I don't know. <laughs> I've never really thought I, about that. <laughs> yeah. And again, my apologies to put you on the spot, but I, I think that attitude also goes a long way, right? So, you know, being open, being willing to have those conversations and also just being the kind of person that you'd want to work with, right? And, and showing up and being like, how would you rate yourself as a team member? Um, yeah, I like teamwork. That's, I mean, that's why I do what I do. I like teamwork. So yeah, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> well, sorry. I, and like, I just work, uh, one of the reasons why I reached out to you specifically is not only because of your role and, um, and the cool things that have been going on in your company and the news, but because I enjoy working with you, right. Mm -hmm. At Zipasby, like we kind of have, like, we have a really good group there. Um, I, like I love our group a lot. Uh, but you get to know some people more than others. And it's always nice kind of interacting and problem solving with you. And that comes through on the email. So, you know, I just, I want to circle back because, uh, <laughs> you know, oftentimes people will say, oh, well, how many A pluses do I need? Or how many A's do I need? Or how much of this do I need? Or what box do I have to check? And I was like, check the decent human being box. Like, can we, can we check that one? <laughs> you know, can we, can we just be be the kind of person that we would want to work with um, because it goes so, so far. You can have the good grades. You can, you know, deliver on projects. Like those are absolutely not bad. In fact, delivering on projects is part of being a good teammate, but also, you know, just being that person that will answer the email if you see it coming in at nine o'clock at night and trying to be helpful and just doing things in a less transactional way because you just want to help out your, your team and just, you know, because that's who you are. So it goes a long way, right? Absolutely. Okay, here's a second question. This is this is the spicy one uh, from a student. Do you regret your regret your career path as a CPA? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I think it opened up a lot of doors, and otherwise, I don't think I would have had those doors. I I honestly can't imagine doing anything else. I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't imagine what else I would do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, and I mean, if the answer is yes, that's okay too, right? Um, but no, it's, it, it, yeah, I'll leave it that one there because it's just authentic. It's like, no. I thought you were going to hit me with a really hard question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think that it's just really hard for me to ask because if I put myself in the position of a student in third or fourth year accounting and they're wondering, shoot, if I plan to be a CPA, will I regret it? And that's why I feel like it's a hard question to ask. Um, because what do you, what do you say to those people? Um, and I know what my answer would be. My answer, I'm going to ask you what your answer would be, but mine, if this person said, Hey, do you regret your career path as a CPA? I'd say, no, um, just like you, it brought me to exactly where I am and I love where I am and I couldn't imagine anything else. I would also say that if there is something that somebody wants to do more, cool, go do that. And that's okay, right? Like you can have your undergrad in accounting or you can have your undergrad in general management or you could or you could still, you know, even beyond that, you could just not. But um, just because you chose one door or one path doesn't mean that that chooses all the subsequent doors or paths and that the rest of them are closed. Like we have, like this is, you worked in commercial real estate, craft beer, the music industry. I feel like there was, oh, the hospitality industry. Like, you know, and if you wanted to switch your focus to operations more inside one of those companies, I'm sure because you earned your, your weight in there and you provided value, you could have pivoted had you so chose to do so, right? Um, just ask. <laughs> just ask, yeah. Hey, like, can I shadow on this? Can I do this? Yeah, just ask. Um, so, you know, to what would you say to the student who say, who's, me be asking the real question, which is, I'm scared that if I go and do my CPA that I'll regret it. What would you say to them? I mean, for me, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was in third and fourth year uh, in university. 
I just think it's important to just try different things. And I mean, you can always try it out and see if you like it or if you don't like it, but it's, it's just nice to have that designation behind your name. Like it, I, I can't see any, like, what are you going to do? You're going to waste maybe two years trying to get it. Right. Yeah. And I, I like how, like, what's the worst you call it wasting when you are, <laughs> when you're a Dow undergrad, you have all your prerequisites, you have, basically like a year of case writing practice, you are well primed to, you know, be very successful in um, the PEP modules uh, in like the graduate diploma programs and to get your CPA. So um, yeah, it sounds like what you said, like at worst, what are you doing wasting? Like, unless you have something that's pulling you somewhere else, why wouldn't you? I feel like you wouldn't be a fourth year accounting student if you had something pulling you somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's no, just me. No, no, no. And you'd be surprised because sometimes momentum gets us to a place. And so I always like to leave the door open. Um, we have one student. Uh, she is. And so I always agree with you. 99.99%. You know, if you're there, you're pretty much like, okay, like this is where I see myself for the foreseeable future. Maybe not forever. Maybe not even five years, but like this is my next two to three years. But if you feel a strong pull. So I have one student and she's going to go be a doctor. That's great. That's amazing. Right? Yeah. So it sounds like your advice and my advice is pretty much the same. It's like, you know, go do what you want to do. And if it's a CPA, um, it's not a life sentence. It's a designation that can open doors. So, you know, you can um, be a CPA engineer. You can be a CPA musician. Um, you know, you can so many different things. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, that leads us into advice. So not just the, the, the person that's asking, hey, I'm afraid I might regret this, but just in general, what would what advice would you have for our current Dallas County majors, a third, a fourth year uh, student in this program? I would say just take on whatever challenges that present themselves. You're going to grow so much professionally and personally between the time you graduate and you're just like the first few years of your career. And I think during that time, gaining work experience is much more valuable than the salary that whatever company is going to pay you. And during that time, you'll you'll get a taste for what you like. And by that time, you'll have the expertise to really just run with what you enjoy doing. And then the salary follows that. <laughs> I like it. That's great. Hey, Tyler. Yeah. How would you define success? This is a okay. question I like to ask um, because it's it's a theme of, of mine, something I hold near and dear, and I'm interested in hearing um, what your answer is to that. Okay, so my definition of success, it's always changing. So I used to think it was like a big house or a fancy car, but I think it just really boils down to enjoying your work. And like I said, when you fall, like when you find a career that makes you happy and excited for Monday every week, success naturally follows that because you'll work hard and then you'll excel and then you're going to have big wins and then you have more big wins. And it's just this circle that keeps on snowballing for years and years. That sounds a lot like the artists that you see succeed that come in for the right reasons that work hard and work on their craft and you see their success build and build. I guess you could say it links it back to what I was talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come full circle. I like it. Uh, I also like how you said that it can change, right? Yeah. Yeah. What I thought success was when I was like 21 is not what I think it is today. And it'll probably be different again in like another few years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay. And it's not like we're sitting here saying, hey, at 21, this is what your definition should be. Or, oh, yours will change. It's like, no, yours might might not change. And that's yeah. okay too. But just don't feel like you need to have it all figured out because this adulting thing is something that, um, I don't know, we kind of spoke about briefly uh, prior to this is that um, when people look at you like you're an authority figure, it, it's like, well, no, I have done some stuff and I have, I am proud of my accomplishments. But don't think, don't replace your your judgment with, with what I've done. Like, I'm not your guru, right? Like we are just people who are living our best lives and we're happy to share and pass on. And I'm, with the hopes of somebody empowering, um, taking those steps for themselves. And if they have this thing, this challenge that they see, 
um, that they go do it. You know, you attack those challenges, you say yes, and you, you chase those challenges um, versus, you know, a paycheck if, if what you're drawn to is, is the challenge and the growth opportunities. Exactly, yes. <laughs> All right, Tyler, we've been at this for a while. Thank you so, so much for being generous with your time. Any final comments, anything else to add? Um, yeah, I just want to say it's important to try different things early in your career. Chances are you're going to quickly outgrow like any job you're going to have out of school. And I think that's natural. Any great employer is going to recognize that and they'll support developing you. So just don't be afraid to make moves or do something that scares you. Love it. Thank you, Tyler. You're welcome.